everyone says they want more learning in their organizations. Today, we're talking about how we can make that a competitive advantage and imperative for our businesses. Welcome to episode number 135 of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. You're going to be glad, too, after I introduce you to our guest today. Her name is Kelly Palmer. She is on a mission to change the way the world learns. She is the Chief Learning and Talent Officer at Degreed. She is a respected thought leader on the future of learning, business, and career transformation, and has also been the Chief Learning Officer at LinkedIn, the VP of Learning at Yahoo, and held an executive position in learning and M&A and product development at Sun Microsystems. She speaks regularly at industry conferences around the world and has been featured in places like Big Think, Forbes, and Chief Learning Officer Magazine, where she writes a regular column on the employee experience. She's also the co-author of a brand new book with Ben and here it is. If you're watching, you can see it. It's called The Experience, excuse me, The Expertise Economy. And she is our guest. And Kelly, I'm glad to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today. And thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And we've, uh, we've, it's taken us a while to make this happen. So I'm especially excited that we finally are here. One time you'd been traveling and not feeling well, and then we had technical challenges, but, but we're here. And, uh, we're here. So, you know, we were just talking before I hit record that you live in San Francisco and the, the list of places that you've worked that sort of makes sense that that's where you are. It's an interesting journey, Kelly. Uh, can you tell us a little bit sort of about your journey um, as a professional, sort of how you got to where you are today? Absolutely. So I have been in tech my entire career and um, I, I moved to the Bay Area um, when I was still in high school, went to university here, and, uh, and started my, the, the large part of my career at Sun Microsystems. I spent many years there. I had several different careers at Sun Microsystems, which was, which was great and in terms of um, career mobility internally at Sun. I think that they were kind of ahead of their time. They looked at um, and tried to give people opportunities to, to move into different areas. So I started out in product development there. Um, got an opportunity to move into corporate strategy and did a lot of work with um, mergers and acquisitions at Sun. And then I kind of had a midlife career crisis and thought, you know, this is great. I love tech and I'm doing a lot of interesting things, but my career kind of went um, uh, along based on the opportunities that were presented to me. And I was always eager to jump in and try new things, but I, I took a step back and said, what am I really passionate about and what do I really want to do with the rest of my career? And I decided that learning was where, where I really wanted to focus my attention and I was fortunate enough to get an executive level position at Sun Microsystem running large uh, revenue generating learning organization and uh, and then went back to school and and got my master's in adult uh, education and education uh, uh, technology and that was kind of the launch of my of my learning career and so I spent four years um, doing that at Sun and when Oracle bought Sun in 2010 um, I got an opportunity to move to Yahoo where I spent a couple of years and then uh, was recruited to LinkedIn through LinkedIn to start um, a learning organization from the ground up at LinkedIn, which was an amazing opportunity. And so spent four years at LinkedIn before I uh, joined Degreed, which is really, um, it, it just keeps getting better, I have to say. You know, uh, Degreed is on a mission to change the way the world learns, and uh, we are an education technology platform. And 
Um, so we're, we're leading the charge there of a real paradigm shift happening in the world of work and learning. So that's kind of my career journey, having a lot of fun. And I don't think that there's ever been a more exciting time to be in the world of, of learning than right now. Well, so people that know me who are listening will know that that's one of the reasons I wanted you on here. Anyone who says they're on the mission to change the way the world learns is going to be someone I'm going to like, I guarantee you. So uh, I want to make an observation for you, though, a uh, little feedback with a bunch of other people listening. You said you had a midlife crisis. Sounds to me like you had a midlife opportunity uh, to me. <laughs> so well, there's my, there's absolutely. my it's not really I, crisis like to me. Sounds right. pretty intentional. Sounds pretty exciting. And it was exciting. Yeah, and that's and that's really great. So, um, because you've had a number of executive positions in the last, you know, ten or twelve years, especially, I'm sure people listening might be interested in just this. And we're gonna, then we're going to really dive into the learning stuff. We're going to dive into the book. But I'm just curious: is is there maybe one or two key leadership lessons uh, on the leadership side that you might share, or, or feel like now is the right thing to, to talk about in that regard from your own um, leadership experience? Right. Well, I, I mentioned. Uh, Clear that you know many opportunities presented themselves to, to me, you know, throughout my career, and I'd say the one big takeaway from that is is that I don't regret um, any of those opportunities, and in fact, I was more than eager to jump into areas where that I didn't really have a lot of experience in, but um, was given the opportunity to try something new and and with people with other executives who believed in me sometimes more than I believed in myself and, and giving me the opportunity to learn and, and actually grow in my career. And so I would say, you know, that's probably as important now um, than ever before is giving people opportunities where, and don't keep people pigeonholed in the same roles, give them opportunities to grow and stretch and to try new things. Because now as an executive of, um, you know, of a education startup company, I have experience in a lot of different areas where I feel like I can now add my experience and expertise where if I was just specializing in one area I don't think it would have been it, it would have led me to this uh, role and to be able to be as impactful as I feel like I can be now so that that would be my advice to leaders is um, give people those stretch opportunities well, and so I'm going to add to that. So we, we want to be giving, as, as you said, Kelly, we want to be giving people those opportunities, but you also said you were willing to take them. So as everyone listening, you may be in the position of saying, don't be afraid to try something different for yourself as well as giving them to others. That's a worth saying. So um, I said we'd talk about the book. So you have this brand new book out, uh, and I have a copy right here. It's really quite awesome. And the book is called The Expertise Economy, how smart, how the smartest companies use learning to engage, compete, and succeed. So this isn't just a learning is nice, learning is wonderful. This is about competitive advantage and using that to drive business results. So talk about when you use that term, because you made up the term, right? The expertise economy. Yeah. What does that mean? What is it? Well, I think that the key message that we're trying to get across with the book is that um, that Today, we're in an environment where there's um, a lot of changes in the workforce, in the workplace, and that's a result of um, automation, acceleration, and the digital transformation that we find most companies are going through today. And so learning is not just a nice to have, and it's not just, oh, let's put together a management or leadership program, or let's put people through compliance training. I'd say 62% of um, CEOs is, is, is a number that um, we've, we got in our research are worried that their employees don't have the skills that they need for their companies to be successful moving forward. In addition to that, we know that employees themselves are worried that they don't have the skills that they need to be successful in the future. And so this idea of the expertise economy is let's elevate that conversation. If CEOs are worried about it, how can we have a conversation with CEOs about what skills their employees already have and what skills they'll need to be successful in the future 
And how do we empower employees to continue to build skills so that they'll stay relevant in their careers? Because if they, if they don't, they, they will become obsolete and companies also will become obsolete. We've seen that happening um, quite, quite a bit in the last few years where industries are being disrupted and, uh, and companies are uh, either getting, being acquired or, or disappearing completely. Right. Uh, or, or, a, or a shell of their former selves, right? So um, there's a phrase that uh, we're sort of talking around right now, and it's a phrase that's been around a lot longer than the idea of the expertise economy. It's that phrase of a learning organization, or sometimes people now talk about a learning culture. So from your perspective, what do those things mean? What does it mean to have that? If that's, if we're trying to get to this place of elevating learning in the, in the, in terms of its strategic importance in the business, what does it really look like or mean to have a learning culture or to do the kinds of things you guys are proponents of? So I, I think it means a paradigm shift in the way you really think about learning at your company. If we think about the models that we've been using over the past few decades, and I think it became a, 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 a reality to me as I started leading learning organizations and realizing that we've been taking some pretty antiquated models and using them in the corporate world, like, you know, sending people to classroom training and having people lecture to them and then, and then measuring impact of learning through, um, through participation rates. And really that doesn't tell you anything about the skills that people have in your company or what you're going to need. And it also doesn't, um, elevate the conversation to business leaders and CEOs. So although they may pay, play, pay lip service to saying, yes, we care about our employees, yes, we care about learning, um, it's hard for them to have a conversation when the conversation is, is around a learning program or participation rates. So this idea of creating a learning culture is about this paradigm shift where, where CEOs and business leaders actually realize that Talking about learning and, and building skills for their company becomes a competitive advantage um, in a couple of ways. One way is, is that people want to work for a company that where they feel like they can learn and grow and build new skills and where they're challenged. So that's part of building a learning culture saying, you know, this is part of our value proposition and this is what we're going to offer to all employees but it's more than that it's also saying that it's rather than being a command and control type of model where you actually tell people what they need to learn and how they need to learn it what we're saying is you're flipping that model and you're saying no let's empower people to actually love to learn what they're interested about and that goes into you know personalized learning and having people um, actually having your whole organization be learning all the time and continuously be building skills so that they're ready for the future. Otherwise, you, you uh, find yourself in, in these positions where we know, for example, Microsoft had to lay off 4,000 employees um, uh, about two years ago because they were moving into a different direction with part of their strategy. And that was painful. And I've, we've seen a lot of companies do that. When I was at Yahoo, that happened as well. Then they hired it wasn't that they were reducing their workforce. They were Absolutely. looking for people with a new skill set. So then they had to hire people for new skill sets. Now what people are doing and Microsoft is doing is saying, look, we want a culture where we're getting ahead of this, where we're saying, what, do, what skills do we think people are going to need? And how can we help our employees that we have today re, uh, upskill, reskill, and uh, get, the, get the skills that they need for the future. And that's a conversation that CEOs and business leaders really get behind and participate in. And, uh, and so now we're seeing learning strategies be part of a business strategy rather than just some one-off program that HR or learning is doing on the side. So, so who are, and I know we talk about this in the book, but who are some examples of organizations that are doing this well? Yeah. Who, a couple well, of examples of what they're doing, uh, of who. Yeah, so. Uh, Unilever is a great example. You know, Tim Munden is their chief learning officer there, and they have 160,000 employees across the globe. And um, their business leaders and CEO are working with Tim to say, look, we, we need a skills strategy um, that is part of our business strategy. So let's work together. So what I love about this is it's not, here's our business 
strategy and now what is the learning strategy on its own or as an afterthought it's built into the business it's strategy right from the start absolutely and so what's so exciting about that is, is that the company has actually said, you know, we want our employees to be learning all the time, every day, learning skills, and we're going to empower them to, to uh, really own their learning. But in addition to that, we're going to give them some guidance and we're going to say, you know, based on what we know about our business and where we're going in the future, here are some of the top skills that we think are going to be really important for our company to succeed in the future. So they've done that kind of at, the, at a higher level and then at a functional level. And then that gives employees the, the idea of, of what skills they may need to, to work on to help the company be successful. But then they encourage their employees also to say, you know, given your career aspirations and what you want to be doing, um, please also focus on skills that you that you want to focus on too to help further your career and then the marriage of those two are you know is is really amazing a couple of other companies that are doing this really well airbnb and we've got mastercard and bank of america um I think that a lot of these companies that you wouldn't necessarily think are you might think are more traditional companies are actually um are actually saying no we need to be more innovative and think about where our you know where our talent is uh, is is going and building their skills for the future. I think the thing that you said that I wanted to highlight for people um, say and mention again is you know you mentioned early uh, the idea of of uh, you know finding out from our team members, finding out from our employees what it is that they want to learn, what their desires are in that regard, and that's great. But the cynic is saying, yeah, but what about the business? Well, you just described with the Unilever example is this this what you call it the marriage. As you were talking, I wrote down the word balance before you wrote. You said marriage. It's this idea of we need to know we need to be clear about what we are think we're going to need organizationally to the examples that you've given, and we got to marry that or we got to balance that against that what the needs are of the individual. Uh, employees, but if we can be clear as an organization about what those organizational needs are, it makes it way easier for the employee too to say, you know what, I hadn't thought of that, but I, I'm I'm on board with that one, right? So it isn't just like asking employees, say, what do you want to learn? Blank piece of paper. Uh, I, I think that that idea of the marriage is super important, not only to sort of quell the cynic, but also to that's that's where you get that's where you get the synergy that you're trying to create. Absolutely. I would add to that that um, we have not harnessed the, the expertise in our companies in a way that's most powerful. I mean, if you think about it, all the tech companies that I mentioned that I've worked for and then I, all the companies that I work with, there's some really incredible talent at these companies that have already mastered a lot of skills or they're actually up to date on the latest trends of what's happening in their area. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you think that there's a small group in, within your organization that has all the answers about what knowledge and what skills are going to be important for the future, you're not taking advantage of your entire workforce. So imagine that you take all these people who are learning about um, machine learning and deep learning or cryptocurrency or cybersecurity. I mean, those are those are some of the fields that are up and coming that are changing on a regular basis. If you have your own employees that are helping uh, keep other employees up to date on or or help them learn about these latest technologies, think of how much better off your company will be. But the only way you get to that point is by creating this learning culture and saying, we want people to be learning all the time and we want people to be sharing their knowledge. And part of what we write about in the book is this notion of peer-to-peer -peer learning and curated content by subject matter experts and really harnessing that in. And I don't think we've ever really done that in companies before in a way, in, in the way that we need to and with the amount of acceleration that's going on, the rate of change is so fast. We've never been able to um, uh, realize this before, but it's hard to keep up with how much is coming at us and how much is changing. So I would say that that's, uh, that's another key component to what we're talking about today. And I think to some people listening, I would say this, it's not just in those up and coming fields and it's not just about keeping up because some of you are in industries where you're, you're feeling this or you're gonna feel this. We have got an organization that got a lot more people with hair the color of Kevin's and they're going to be leaving us. And oh my gosh, what am I going to do in the next three years to keep, to keep all this expertise in the organization? So some people, we end up, drive, we, we end up 
scurrying to solve some of these questions when we realize that we're going to have all this expertise leaving. But the point is, and I, I just want to sort of add to your point for people listening, is it isn't just about those new things and it isn't just about the places where everything's changing. You've got these needs throughout the organization. And if you create that culture, you've got that across everything in the organization, including your accounting department, that maybe there isn't some major thing happening for them in the same sort of way. You've got extra right. that you don't want to lose and you need to share across. And the last thing I would add to that, as I, I was struck as you were saying that, is, is if we've got people who, who are on the cutting edge, edge and are learning things, or even have just been to a conference and are going to come back and share with others, you know, all of you listening have had this experience of when you have to teach it, you learn it better anyway. So there's this additional advantage for that person who is now sharing it, right? Uh, the, the, the value that comes for them in terms of clarifying their own thought and making it clearer for them. Right. More value. And and as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, some of these aren't you know, new ideas per se, you know, about sharing information. But what is different is that technology is, is now caught up and helping enable some of these things that just weren't scalable. So you imagine a person going to a conference and coming back in, in the old days, it would be, oh, write your trip report share it with your team, but you know, it, it, it doesn't go very far, right? It stays, but now with technology and this idea that you, there's this vast amount of information out there. Now you can share information in a way that was never possible in the past. And in fact, one of our challenges is now is how to use technology to, um, to really feel less overwhelmed by all the content and the learning that's out there so that you can actually help people find what's the best, what's the most relevant and that. But I would say, you know, some of these old ideas are new again with the technology and the acceleration pieces, I think uh, making them new. And allows, and allows and enables to, us to actually do it scale it to your point. So um, I, I'm, I often, I often sit here, I have, I have the great blessing to listen and, 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 and converse with smart, wise people like you. And I often stop and say, okay, what am I, what am I thinking if I'm the listener? You know, if I'm in the audience and because they can't sit at the table with you, virtually with you and I, at least not and engage. So the question that I'm guessing that people are asking themselves is this, okay, that all sounds really great if you're the CLO at Unilever or Airbnb or Microsoft right? Or degree. Thank you very much, Kelly. But how do I deal with this? What can I, what can I do with this? If I'm an individual leader, uh, a, a middle manager, a frontline supervisor in my organization, how can I take some of these ideas, even if my organization isn't quite there? What advice do you have for them to use this on an everyday basis outside of the big corporate umbrella sort of conversation we've been having? Right. I think that there's a lot of things that uh, individual managers and leaders can do. And I always talk about it in terms of a microcosm of the, of the bigger company. But say, for example, you work at a company that actually doesn't really have a learning culture the way we've described and is more of a command and control, yet you're a leader that's kind of realizing that you want to help your team uh, build skills for the future for your team and for you can create a microcosm of a learning culture within your own organization and or even even with a few people um, and and it's a lot about attitude and it's, a lot of it is about communication so it's like saying as a leader I want to tell my employees look I I support your learning and I want to help you build or I want to enable you to build new skills and to learn all the time so I want you know I I will encourage you to uh, learn all the time if go out and one of the things that's really cool is like if it, it's this idea that there's so much content out there um, a lot of it is low cost or no cost right that you can actually get content out there there's ted talks and youtube videos and podcasts podcasts. Like the one we're doing right now exactly I mean, we did some research uh with degree last year where we found that um uh people are willing to spend their own time and their own money on the learning that they need and they're actually not necessarily going to their um to their em uh, employer's learning management system to find the learning that they need because what what's out there is readily available so as a leader you can say look there's all I make them aware that this is okay um, and that 
encourage you to to keep learning and building new skills all the time. And in fact, we can reward you, you know, for, for doing that. So I would say that's a good first step. Create a learning culture in your team and uh, and encourage people to be learning all the time. That's, that's awesome. There's an idea. So thank you for that. There's an idea in the book that you talk about that that we probably can't unpack completely, but I'd love for you to share briefly with people, and, and it would be one more reason why people ought to buy the book, and we are talking about uh, the book, The Expertise Economy, and we're talking with one of the co-authors, Kelly Palmer, and the, that idea, it's nearer the, nearer the end of the book, Kelly, you talk about the idea of a skills quotient. I think there's a lot of people listening that would get a lot of value out of the, the basic idea here, so can you sort of outline that for people, because I thought it was really, really smart, and it could be really helpful. Yeah, so the idea around the skills quotient came, again, as we're trying to appeal to more um, business leaders and CEOs to get involved in a conversation about the skills gap that is so crucial to the success of both individuals and companies uh, moving forward. So how do you have that conversation uh, with um you know, at the individual level, at the team level, at the organizational level, at uh, the company level, and even at the industry level about the skills gap. And so the skills quotient asks some very simple questions. It's, and it, it seems so simple and so obvious, yet I don't think we ask them. So for example, if you start at the individual level and you say, what skills do I have? And just take an inventory of what skills you have. And I, you'd be surprised at how many people haven't ever thought of it in those terms. Usually they think about what degree did I get at university or what, ex what job did I have, right? And, and, and instead, think about what skills do I have and then what skills do I need for the future? That's a great starting pl place. And then you can actually see where the gap are with where what you have and what you'll need you'll also be sometimes surprised to find out for example you know I, I talked a little bit about my career journey and even though I'm a CLO people might uh, just assume okay these are the skills that a CLO has but they don't take into account I've had some other careers in my past and by the way I've done acquisition integration and corporate strategy so now if my company is doing an acquisition Hey, I have some skills that I could that I could offer to that um, to that equation. That's happening all throughout the industry. We're not even aware. So then, take it up to the team level. If you're a manager or a leader, and you say, "Do I know the skills that the people in my organization have?" and take a skills inventory. And do I know what skills we think people are going to need? There's so much information that can be gained there. And then you can have a strategy around how you're going to uh, fill that skills gap based on what people have, what they need, and then also the guidance from the company. So it's a very simple model, yet I think incredibly effective to think about um, the skills gap and how we're going to fill that for the future. I, I appreciate that. I, I've got a couple of questions uh, that are bigger picture ideas that even take us out of the organization because you know I, the first thing I said about you to everybody was that you're on a mission to change the way the world learns and one of the pieces of that puzzle is university and um, I have a daughter who's a sophomore in college and so I have a question for you that's what advice do you have for her? Uh, and really, there's obviously lots of people listening. In fact, there may be college students listening to us anyway. But what's your advice to my daughter, uh, a sophomore? at the Kelly School of Business. Um, what's your advice to her around learning and what she ought to be thinking about in that regard? Right, so I would say, um, you know, I, my son actually graduated uh, from University of Oregon about a little over a year ago. And so this isn't a, a kind of a hypothetical, I could give your daughter similar advice that I, that I gave uh, my son. I think it's daunting for college students to think that they're, trying to pick the career for the rest of their lives, you know, while they're going to university. You pick a major, then you go through, um, you know, prescribed curriculum in order to get your degree. So my advice to your daughter and the, the same advice that I gave my son is that, you know, you're building, college is fantastic. It's a great experience and you're learning foundational skills, but you, um, it's, not the, it's not the end of your journey. When you graduate, it's the beginning of your journey. And you might uh, end up landing a job in the field where you 
studied. But for a lot of people, I used to ask people at, um, we, we hired a lot of new college graduates at LinkedIn. And I used to hold a round table and ask them, you know, what, what did you study in university and what are you doing now at LinkedIn? And they weren't necessarily matched. But you get a great foundation and you get, get a great education from going to university. So the advice is, is don't get too worried about figuring out what the career is for your lifetime based on your college degree. Realize that it's just the beginning of your learning journey. And when you actually you know, land your first job, you're going to be learning new skills continuously. And you, as we've talked about earlier in the podcast, you probably will change careers many times in your in your future and in fact we know from um, research that Millennials tend to change jobs every two years um, and find new experiences so I guess it's realized that it's the beginning of your learning journey and you don't have to have it all figured out you know and during your college experience so one last thing about that before we shift gears and that is um, when you think about the future of learning, and we've talked a lot about that in the organization, how, and this is something that I've thought a lot about, but I haven't written a book about these areas, so I want your input. Um, how is college going to be different in five years or 10 years or 15 years from now? Yeah, so um, we do write about that um, in, in, in the book that, you know, that this whole paradigm shift around education is is happening everywhere, right? It's happening in universities. Universities are wondering, am I helping students prepare for real world of work and are they are they really prepared or are we are we just doing more theoretical things companies are having to pick up the slack a lot of times for new college grads who you know may have studied one thing and but now we're on the job or or they studied that thing that they got hired for but they still have skill gaps and the companies have to pick up um, the slack for that and then in Individuals, what's the individual responsibility for actually building your own skills to get ready for to get better at the job that you have or to get ready for job of the future. So what I would say in terms of universities is, is that one of the things that we realized is that there's a couple of things that universities can do. They can partner more closely with companies to understand what students really need to be uh, prepared for the world of work. And I tell the story in the book about um, the University of Oregon's public relations program that actually spend, you know, they spend uh, the last year of a student's um, uh, uh, time in college actually giving them real work at a real company and then having them um, uh, get evaluated of their, por their portfolio of work, not just by professors at the university, but they bring in PR industry experts to give uh, students feedback on their work and give them a chance to present in a high pressure situation. And so by the time they've graduated, they have a sense of what it, it's like to actually do real work for a real company and then get that feedback. So they're a little bit better prepared for the world of work. And um, one last thing I'll say about this is uh, there's several ideas in the book that I'll let people read about, but another idea was how universities tend to, you know, spend four to five years with um, students, and then once they graduate, they're kind of off in the work world, and they lose track of those students. And what if they were to stay connected to those students, not just because they're alumni and they want to get donations for the university moving forward, but because they want to help them continue with their education moving forward so that they can help them continue to build skills. What a great opportunity for both the students and the university to continue that, that relationship. So if I were to think about everything we've talked about, the one, the one of the words that keeps coming up for me is the word process. And you've just described at the university level a more about a different thinking about thinking about the process. And th throughout the course of our, our time, we've talked a lot about that. And so long time listeners are wondering, Kevin, are you going to do the fast break, which I normally do? I'm not because I spent that time. I wanted to let um, uh, let us talk and let Kelly talk a little bit about the future uh, of that. And, and hopefully that was a that sort of was thought for provoking for all of you. So if you if you're here regularly and you were waiting for the fa fast break next week. And if you're here, if you wonder what it is, next week. Um, but I do have a couple of final questions for you, Kelly. One is, um, so what do you do, all this stuff you're doing, traveling around, giving talks, thinking about important things, doing important work, what do you do for fun? 
Oh, that's a great question. I just got back from a, a, a vacation in, in Italy. And, uh, and so I, I love to travel uh, personally. I'm continuing to build my language skills. I speak a bit of Italian, but I'm continuing to, to, uh, to uh, hone in on my language skills there. And I also love to cook. So I, I cook a lot and I took some cooking classes while I was, uh, while I was on vacation uh, there as well. So so uh, that's part of what I like to do for fun. See, aren't you all aren't you all glad to know that the person who's talking about learning for 30 minutes also sees learning as fun? I was certainly hoping <laughs> something I didn't know, but I was certainly hoping that we'd get consistency there. <laughs> so uh, second to last question, and this one is so something one of the ways that we can learn, certainly not the only one, but one of the ways that we, the ways that we can learn is by reading. And so what is something that you're reading now or that you've read recently that you might share with everybody? Yeah, there's uh, there's two books that I read recently that I just really made me uh, think differently about a few things. The first one is a book by Todd Rose called The End of Average, How We Survive in a World that Values Sameness. And I think, uh, you know, people in... You know, anybody can can get value from this because it really talks about how companies and organizations are are um, operating based on this notion of the standard person when there's actually no standard person or standard career path and that. So and and Todd uh, Todd Rose actually runs the Mind Brain and Education uh, program. Harvard University um, and was a has an interesting story. He was a college or a high school dropout and then, mm -hmm. and now he's a Harvard professor. So great story. I would highly recommend that. And um, I'm just gonna add to that. Like I'm right with you, okay. buddy. That's a two thumbs up. So we haven't even got her second book yet, but already this is <laughs> the most expensive podcast of the day because you gotta buy two books so far. And you, gotta, you need to buy the end of average and you need to buy, of course, the expertise economy. But what's the other one you've got for us? Okay. So the other one I have is a book um, called The Hundred Year Life, and it's by Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott. And what I love about, uh, about this book is this idea that we're living longer, and yet we, um, we haven't really adjusted our the way we think about the phases of our life. And so traditionally, the phases of our life have been, you know, the first part is about um, education, you know, from zero to 20. Then the mid part of your life is about working and family. And then the last part of your life is about retirement. And what we're finding now is that that it isn't so clear cut now. People are living, um, as the book is, is implying, you know, up to 100 years, which means that people are actually uh, uh, working longer too, not just because they have to in some cases, but a lot of times because they want to. How cool is that? And it may not be in the same way that they're working today. Like it may not be in, uh, in a traditional company environment. Maybe it's working in a different way, but this idea that we can now use skills um, to think about how we want to spend the latter you know, different parts of our life and that we can get on and off the, the career ladder. It's not, it's not a ladder straight up it's more of a lattice and people can jump on and jump off and that they can work longer and do things that fulfill them and give them meaning and purpose in their life and I, I just find it incredibly inspiring and also a call to action to say what are we doing about those people we have this super obsession with millennials and new college grads coming into the workforce and how are we going to uh, cater to them and figure out who they are and what they want but we have no attention on the the people from 50 to 70 or 80 who are continuing, who can continue to add value to the workforce and who need those opportunities for new challenges and development as well. So hundred year life. hundred year life. So speaking of call to action, um, where do you, where can we go to learn more about what you're up to and about this book? Right. So we have a, a website called uh, theexpertiseeconomy.com, and you can go and find out where David and I are, are, are speaking and a little bit more about the book. And, uh, and so that, that's one way. You can also go to uh, degree.com, which, uh, you know, we are changing the way the world learns. And uh, we haven't talked much about it today, but, you know, there is a, a consumer component to Degree where you can go 
go online today and sign up for a personalized learning profile and start to track it. So if you listen to uh, this podcast, you can actually track it as one of your learning assets in your personalized learning profile and then see all the other con uh, learning content that's available. So you can learn more about how learning is changing by, uh, by going to degree.com as well. There you go. And now my call to action to all of the rest of you, and that is now what? What are you going to do with this? You had the chance to listen to our, into our conversation and hopefully get, be inspired and be informed, but we need you to take action. And so my challenge to you is what did you get from this that you want to act on as an individual? Maybe it's what, what Kelly just said just now. Maybe it is um, taking a new sense and starting to think about your skill quotient for yourself. Maybe it's thinking about what the challenges are for you as an individual leader. Maybe if you're listening as a senior executive, maybe it's time to rethink some of the way you're thinking about learning your organization. What is it that you're going to do as a result of our time together? Because without that, it will have been less than valuable, less, certainly less valuable than it could have been. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. It was certainly worth the wait. I'm glad we finally were able to connect. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. It's been fun. All right, everybody, we're done, but only for this week. It is a process. We're here every single week. And if you're just now listening for the first time, there's a whole lot of others. Great learning that you could get by listening to others. Put them all in your degree profile. Uh, there you go, right here, every week on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.